you know, Newton's second law of motion. So anyway, um, all of a sudden they'd be in the Bermuda Triangle and they would notice that the, the radar, there's the ship, I can see it, but it's not on the radar anymore. What happened here? And so that became the beginning of what we call stealth technology today with the F-117s and the B-2 and all the other stuff. But in between, there was a lot of quirky things and crazy things that happened. And that was kind of the beginning, and that's what we have, the debunking process is what I was involved with at in the University of Michigan as one of my projects. Well, being back there, I was had a, I had a cohort in all of this. His name was Stephen Eberbaugh. His dad owned the Eberbaugh pharmacy chain on the East Coast. And Stephen and I were playing around with a lot of other stuff, just besides what was going on at the University of Michigan. Stephen and I were hooking up electrodes to our occipital and parietal lobes in our brain and stimulating with electricity. Now, today that's not a big deal, but I guess it was back in the 50s. Nobody had done that yet. And we had built ourselves an oscilloscope, and we were actually monitoring these brain patterns and combining that with hypnosis and deep sleep therapy. So this is the kind of stuff we were doing. Well, the government kind of found out about what we were doing because obviously this was a, you know, a pretty highly restricted area that I was working in anyway. And in those days, they were looking for kids that were a little bit different. Today, uh, our scholastic systems are geared so that the corporations want the kids coming out of school. So they'll push everybody through to herd out the kids that they want. And of course, as a result of that kind of a consciousness, we end up with a lot of kids going through high school and, and grade school that can't read or write when they hit the streets because they were pushed through along with the brighter ones that are the more astute ones that were able to do these things rather quickly. And the corporations, of course, funded these projects and schools, and, and of course, they want to have the kids. So that's what happens. Our school system is a little corrupt, to say the least. In those days, it was about the end of World War II, and everybody was paranoid that Russia had the bomb and the Iron Curtain was there and so they were looking for kids that might make a difference in the science community after they got out of school and I happened to be one that was chosen. At some point in there, I don't know exactly when, I suppose I was given a secret clearance. It wasn't until a little bit later when I was down in Arkansas because my, my mother had now long since divorced my father and married her, my stepfather and moved to Arkansas. So right in the middle of all this crazy government stuff that I was doing at the University of Michigan, we decided to move in the 11th grade I was in down to Pleasant Plains, Arkansas, which didn't last very long. I think I fi finished three semesters or four semesters down there, and Uncle Sam came and took me away, and um, I was herded off to uh, the Air Force. Uh, but before I could go in the Air Force, you had to be 17 years old, so there was a slight problem. I was only 16. And I had been out of the government graces for about a year while I lived in Arkansas, which didn't set too well. So they immediately took me down and billeted me in Little Rock, Arkansas, near an army base down there that was involved with uh, chemical weaponry and the manufacture of biological warfare devices. So I got a little education in that at 16 years old. On my 17th birthday, I was on a bus on the way to Lackland Air Force Base in the beginning of my basic training which I completed at the United States Armed Force Institute at Keesler Air Force Base and went on into service up at Point Arena, California, 776th Aero Squadron. And that's an interesting place to work. First of all, that was part of a series of early warning radar sites set around uh, the, the continental United States. Above us were what were called BMU sites up in Greenland and places like that, which were very, very high power radars. And we worked with a radar set called an ANFPS-35, which itself uh, had a 466-foot antenna, was nine stories tall. And we had one installed at Point Arena, and we also had one back at Montauk in New York, Upper Long Island. And I think, I'm sure a lot of you out there have heard the stories of Montauk and all the stuff that Preston Nichols and all these other people espoused have happened to them. But there is one thing that I did notice working with this particular radar, and that was that it had an <clears throat> operating frequency of the klystron magnetron tubes, mostly klystrons. This was, magnetron, by the way, was an earlier magnetic radiation amplifying tube, and it was later on replaced by a klystron, which was a oscillating magnetic tube, which was a little higher power and more efficient. But what I'm trying to get to is it had an operating frequency, a local oscillator frequency, if you would call it that, of 375 to 425 megahertz. And that particular frequency 
uh, is measured if you were to look at it in some kind of a linear form, you'd look at the length of the wave before it goes from positive to negative back to positive, and how much space does it travel in time and space across the moving air uh, before it completes one cycle of it of itself, and it happens to be about three feet or 39 centimeters. Well, strangely enough, three feet or 39.9 centimeters is about the length of human DNA. So when you start putting million watts of local oscillator frequencies around human beings at a, a central frequency of their human DNA, you start having a lot of strange things happen. And I'll guarantee you, we had all kinds of strange things happen at Point Arena Air Force Station. But beyond that, <clears throat> we another thing that I noticed was that uh, we had a operating window of about 450 miles. It's been since declassified because the radar is now obsolete. But at that time, it was highly classified. And we had another set called an ANFPS-26, which had a height capability of several miles also. So we could look how high an object could be. And we could see how far away it was. And the idea of this was if we saw something that we didn't understand, then we would scramble jets from nearby Hamilton Air Force Base, which was part of a strategic air command, which I was serving in at that time, which was based at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. So we would send out scrambled jets for things that we didn't know what, what they were. Well, there was an exception to the, what, the scrambling rule, and that was what we saw every night. What we saw every night on this radar was many, many, many objects coming from outer space with a descent speed of approximately 20,000 miles an hour, far beyond the capability of our jets, to an altitude of five to seven to 10,000 feet, and then slowing down, making an extreme left-hand turn facing the west and going down towards Mexico at a lateral speed of about 5,000 miles an hour. And this is pretty much happening every night in those days, and this, of course, was have been in the early 60s, so I was pretty amazed by this. As a matter of fact, not only was I amazed by this and intrigued by this, but I was annoyed by this because the people that actually officially made the observations of these 5,000 mile an hour lateral flying objects were called scope dopes, meaning that they looked at these big round screens you've all seen on these sci-fi movies with a big round screen and a beam that goes around and around and it hits something and it lights up It kind of leaves a little residue thing that kind of fades away until it comes around and sweeps around and lights it up again. And that, that sweeping that you see on the screen is representing the, this, the direction that the antenna is looking at at that given time and what the beam is hitting. And so the people that watched that were called scope dopes and they had to fill out a form when they saw something different. And this form was called a DDS Form 332. If you want to look it up in the archives, the DDS Form 332. They filled these forms out every night with all these objects being described, but strangely enough, we did not scramble uh, any jets at all for these because there's nothing we could do about it. We just watched them. We were the audience. And the thing that really disturbed me was the fact that these DDS Form 332s were not uh, reported to anybody. They were basically shredded the next day. So in other words, this never really happened. And that's kind of how the Air Force went in those days. Uh, it just never really happened. The other thing that was very interesting about the ANF PS-35 radar was developed by Westinghouse and General Electric of Sylvania and a few of the folks over at Los Alamos. And the radar, even though we were installing it and working with it back in the in the 60s, was actually developed in the, in the late 40s. The Almogordo Valley is conveniently located between Albuquerque, New Mexico and just north of Santa Fe, provides a perfect path to to transmit and receive high-powered radio frequency signals without broadcasting the nearby universe. And so this is what the area that was chosen, and of course Los Alamos being up Santa Fe way, uh, was chosen to develop these radars. And a lot of the more modern weather control equipment, which we'll talk about later on, was also developed there. And what happened is back in the 40s, late 40s, when this stuff was coming out around about 46, 47, when the transmitters were up and running, putting out about the high-powered sets that we were developing then were 5 to 10 million watts, mostly around 5 million watts. The stuff we had at Pearl Harbor was a few thousand watts back in uh, 1942, 1941, those times. So it really wasn't the radar, which was originally developed in England, uh, 
the radar that they had then was nothing like what we were developing in the late 40s, much, much more power, thousands of times more powerful. And what was happening was we were being observed by a lot of different extraterrestrials because this kind of energy does go out into space and it is um, detectable and it is kind of noticeable. And to about anyone that's around that has any kind of sensitivity. And so at the time, the greys were, the Theta Reticuli people were studying and hanging out a lot with these facilities and watching what we were doing. I don't know whether we'd made contact it or not. I know we did in 51, but 